Welcome everyone to episode 390 of Just Joshing, the start of a very special week as part one of my three-part conversation with Marcio Catalano is live. That's right, this is going to be three parts this week. Marcio has such amazing, diverse audio career, audio acting, and more. In fact, the end more is going to be the cliffhanger to this week's episode. It's actually a very, very fun one. In all fairness, there was so much conversation here. This was easily one of the longest interviews I've ever done. Uh, we had well over, well at four hours of conversation, and to cut that to about two and a half hours, there's probably going to be a lost episode of Marcius somewhere down the road. There's just so much we talked about here. But for the purposes of this, I'm, we're going to start about 45 minutes into the conversation and go from there. Uh, it I was incredible. I had a lot of fun doing this. I think you guys are going to have a lot of fun listening to this. Marcia is one of the most fascinating people I've ever had on the show. And uh, I think you guys will be pleasantly blown away. And I'm going to announce real quick what my 400th episode is going to be since we are about 10 episodes away at this point. I'm going to be talking about my freelancing career so far. Uh, This is going to be a special 30, 40 to 45 minute chat about just the do's and don'ts of freelancing and this came about because my sister suggested it um yesterday i had to do something i i felt really bad i still kind of feel really bad about it is i had to actually fire a client and a client was a good friend and i i still and feel terrible about it but in so doing talking to my sister and talking to a few other things uh about, about just not only that but just general what i've done with freelancing so far she goes to me you know you got a lot of gold here you should do something with it so that's what i'm going to do for episode 400 all right let's just get to this conversation and we'll talk more after this episode of just joshing is sponsored by indie imprint indie imprint supports creators by creators whether you are writing a book or creating a video game Indie Imprint works with its clients to produce, edit, and present their projects to the world. For more information, check out their website at www.indieimprint.com. That's my opinion in a nutshell. <laughs> oh, I got you. So, so no, I, I, I let you go because I feel you had a lot you had to say. I, I laughed a little bit because some of it is very funny to me. Um, if you're a small business, I feel sorry for you right now. Uh, no, I, I feel sorry for you right now because those. I think. I think more than anybody else, that's the demographic that suffered the most. Because you had a storefront, you had something you, you were building, and you had to stop. And the unfortunate, the unfortunate reality, in, in even in Canada, I'm not sure they came to the aid of their small businesses quick enough. Some of this business every day we stay closed is less likely. Some of those small businesses open up ever we'll again. Survive, yeah. 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 Right. And that. And that's. I'm and, in agreement with that. Yeah, yeah, that part, I if you're one of those people and you're pissed off at the world a little bit right now, I can't blame you. I, 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 I will let you got it pass. I, you can be mad. I think you've earned that right. Everybody else. So for me, my Facebook feed, I, so this is, I made a conscious decision at the very beginning of this that I would not pay attention to the news. Once I realized that the news was just throwing all these random ass stories, it doesn't matter what country, these random ass stories about what the virus could do or would do, and, and it, it occurred to me very quickly that nobody actually knew what the hell was going on. No one still knows yeah, what the hell's, yeah, right? Yeah, right, and no one still knows what the hell's going on. So why am I listening to this? It doesn't serve any purpose for anything. But then, what, then but what I'm seeing now is, my friends groups are growing into really two categories, right? Category one, do your duty, do this, do that. You're, you're a terrible person if you don't wear the mask, don't wear the gloves, all this, all, and there's, there's that category. Then there's the other category, the government is planning to use this to take over us and this, 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 and this. I wish both sides would talk to each other. They, I think they'd help each other quite a lot, actually, but they, they said they're fighting with each but other. They don't, they, they won't, because yeah. they want to be right. Yeah, and that's ego. That's yeah, we, and, and the thing, and the thing is, there are. Look, should we trust our leaders having this kind of power right now? Probably not. Do I think that this is a massive conglomerate plot to take over the world? No, I do not. No, right, not. right, right. No, I do not. So, right. I, and that's that's the kind of thing. That, like, that's, like that's giving them too much credit. Well, I, look, I watched. I, look, look, I read a story once in the 1920s. The government was put in charge of a whorehouse, and they took it out of business inside two years. How the fuck do you screw up a whorehouse? How the hell do you screw that up, right? But um. But no pun intended. How do you screw up a whorehouse? Yeah, yeah, exactly. 
exactly. How <laughs> you screw that up? But the point, so I, I, there are things that the government's doing I'm worried about in terms of how they're doing it. Not necessarily what they're doing, but how they're doing it. And I'm not sure that these are good practices in the long run. Flip side, people are dying. 2.3%, just, let's go 2% just for just for numbers sake here. Sure, sure, sure. Right? 2% of 7.7 7 billion people is about, what, 35 million people? It's a lot of people. Yeah. It, it's not a small number. Right? Yeah. It's not a small number. And, and, and it's, you know, I, 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 like I said, I don't know how you long know this is. You know what scares me about that? Yeah. You know what scares me about that, what you just said? Yeah. It, it is a small number. We agree. It's, it's 2%, let's say, roughly. Yeah. But why would you even want to take a chance? Exactly. That's what I'd like to ask somebody. You know, I'd like to say to somebody, uh, let's say it's not that bad. I'll give you the entire argument. It yeah. isn't the majority. Yeah. It's a small percentage. It, it, some people who get it, you know, they're not going to show symptoms, right? They're asymptomatic, whatever. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing. Why, even with all of that in your favor, would you still want to take a chance? Yeah, exactly. That's, it's not smart. And, and if you're wrong, if you're wrong, let's say, mm -hmm. you're putting others at risk. Mm -hmm. That, to me, is incredibly selfish. Yeah. That's the issue I have, I, right? I, I have no issue with a person's opinion or belief yes. system. Yeah, no. If you believe in the conspiracy theory, if you really fucking believe that China, a government that is communist, that has the opposite motive of the United States, and they do not get along, and they have a current trade war, and you've got all of these cultures from around the world that can't even agree through the UN, right, on petty things, you really think they got together suddenly in 2020 and they're all against you? Dude, you're not that special. Sorry. Yeah. You know, if you want to believe in that conspiracy theory, go ahead. If you want to blame people for being too delayed on reactions, go ahead. But the point is this. You don't know. You don't know. You, you can't even admit that you don't know. And if you don't know, why would you be so bold? Yeah. Because history has has backfired on arrogance. History has backfired on the person who, I, I know, and you're wrong. Whoops. Whoa, whoa, whoa. He's got a surprise coming to him. It's not very intelligent. No. It's very intellectual, but it's not very intelligent, I, right? I, 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 I've got all these facts, yeah, all these facts that you've connected through your way of connecting the dots to prove an outcome of a perspective mm. that you want to prove correctly. Yeah. If that's the case, you know, you, you can make a case for anything in this universe. At, at some point, you have to have a standard. Like, and at, at some, some point, point at, you at, gotta go live your life. Yeah, yeah, you at know, some, at some, I need to say this, get a life, and I've never said that to anybody, like, get a life, right? Yeah, yeah, but, so... Get a life, because you're not going to, Josh, these people are not politicians. Here's, yeah. here's the reality, here's the facts. Can we sum it up and, and go on to another topic? Yeah, actually, I, I, I was about to, yeah. this topic is, man. This topic reminds me of my father and my uncle when I was a kid. My dad and my uncle would talk politics for three hours over coffee. And at the end, every single week, they would say the same thing. They'd sum it up with, well, you know what? We can sit here debating this all we want. But in the end of the day, we've never changed anything for the rest of the world. So let's go get something to eat. Yeah. And I always used to go as a kid like, my God, why did these men keep doing this conversation? Because it, 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 it was a form of bonding and an excuse to drink booze. I just wish we just... Yeah. I, just I, 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 I just... Yeah, yeah. So, no, no, no. So, so, so I just wish... See, the chance to complain commonly about something while having a drink. Yeah, 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 no, no, absolutely. No, see, I, I just wish we could skip the fighting part and go straight to the booze drinking. And look, look, we can't do much... Uh, we can't do much... Because everybody would be a lot happier. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Like, so I'll tell you what I've done. The last thing I'll do before we move on is I'll tell you what I've done since this. If they were drinking, they'd probably listen better. Possibly, possibly. Or they'd wake up in like a like um in a, in, a, in a dumpster somewhere. But that's okay. That that no no one's gonna judge them in this time. No one is. Yeah. I decided like for me, I decided I would be kinder. I I go to five random people each day. I tell them how much I appreciate them. I've written more. I keep doing the podcast. I've had the opportunity to talk to people like yourself. I've really been grateful 
for the opportunities I've been getting. As a result of this, I've started my freelance career. I, I think I'm nuts, but that's okay. That, that, in a good way, in the best possible way. Um, I'm, I'm doing things, and that's the, and, and I decided, like, you know what? However long this lasts, however this goes, one day it will end. And that's the thing. One day this will be over. And although life may not be to ever be the same, it might be better. Why not create a better life for yourself? Why you you're. Know, I, I have a suspicion it will be. Yeah, I do too. Because I mean, so now we're now we're quite a bit into the conversation. We start to see ourselves a bit. We start to to be more honest. In many ways, I appreciate that this happened, and I want to clarify what that means. I'm not glad it happened. I do not like to see people suffer. No one does. But I like, and maybe this is a silver lining. I like that people are starting to look at themselves. Yeah they're starting to take inventory that they're being forced whether they like it or not to be put into a position to take responsibility we, we've hit adversity this is I, we're, yeah. whatever, that, 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 if, this. If, you, if you're looking at yourself and you're complaining and you don't like what you see that's the thing about human beings you know when you're distracted every day and you're doing your daily routine you're going to work and you're picking up the kids and you've got the dry cleaning and dinner plans at seven or you know some concert you're attending you're busy but busy is just busy mm -hmm. that doesn't have meaning no that doesn't prove that it has meaning and suddenly when all those things are removed all those exterior things are removed what do you have you've got you you're left with yourself and now you don't look at yourself and now when you're alone without the distractions you gotta tell the truth about yourself mm -hmm. and some people are doing okay and others are not and that's because maybe you don't like what you see and maybe that's the lesson right lessons aren't learned easily right mm -hmm. suffering builds character absolutely I would I, I would I, I amend that slightly adversity builds character I think I, I can't speak for any other part. I, I think any other part of the world, any other part of the world. I went through adversity ten years ago, so for me, this is kind of like whatever. Like I, I've been through tough times. I know what this is gonna. I, I know the, there's gonna be ups. There's gonna be downs. But as long as I keep doing something, I'll be fine. Right? I know this personally. Not a lot of people to look up, and I'm not saying that life hasn't thrown challenges at them, but a, like an adverse, an adversity is something that, that's beyond their control. Right, that that's way beyond your control. I think this is the first time a lot of people have been through something like this, and it's a great thing to go through at least once in your life because at that point, again, like you said, you got no choice. It's you. It, it, sooner or later, it's it's all about who you are in this moment and who you can. And then at that point, once you realize that, once you can't run from that anymore, it's about who you want to become after, right? And that's a big, big step for a lot of people. When this is over. I mean, a lot more people are going to be a lot stronger mentally, right? Just simply because they've been through this moment in time in their lives where they've dealt with anxieties and fears and uncertainty. Like, this kind of uncertainty is, is a strange thing for a lot of people. But it's a good thing. It's actually always been this way. But now it's just come to the surface. This is how life actually works. You never know what's yeah. going to happen tomorrow. Yeah. Right? Yeah. They've been given the contrast that life isn't always that one note that you were accustomed to. There is this other possibility, right? Life is a bandwidth. Yeah. Most exactly. of the time we're in the middle. Yeah. So we're not aware of the extreme outsides. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's what's happening. Like you're saying, that's what's happening. Yeah. So that's 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 what's going on with a lot of people right now. I think, I, I, I like I said, I think um, the longer this goes, the more normal it will change. So, and whatever normal will become after this, people today will be a lot stronger for it going through this now. Something, you know, it's interesting that you said that because it's something that happened to me recently. I was talking to a friend of mine uh, just a day ago, adding to what you just said. She has a daughter. Um, her daughter, I think, is like somewhere between 8 to 10. She said that since this happened, she noticed um, a change in her daughter's behavior. Mm -hmm. Prior 
until all this, her daughter was like, Mom, can you buy me this? Mom, can you, you know, oh, Mom, why is this this way? I don't like this one. I like the purple one, not the pink one. You know, that kind of stuff. Just being a kid. Mm -hmm. To be fair, just being a kid. But, you know, whining a little bit. You know how kids always want everything done for them and complain at every turn because they're kids. They're new on the planet. They're just learning the ropes, you know. But ever since this stuff has happened, she said that her daughter suddenly is like, Mom, you know, have you called, have you called grandma? Mom, she, all of a sudden, the complaints lessen, the concerns for others, and the awareness have increased. And it wasn't something that she did. It wasn't something she had to tell her daughter. It just happened because something's in the air, you know? Kids are smart. Kids, I mean, you know, kids are smart. They see what's going on, you know, and they react to that ambiance. And what that told me is that this generation of young people will be very mindful of this, hopefully, hopefully, that, you know, uh, everything isn't always going to be okay. There is a possibility that at some point stuff can change abruptly, which is what this is. Well, yeah, well, this is, well, you, the, the one thing I sincerely hope, and, and then we'll talk about your Chinese, how, how you got to China, is empathy will go up in general. Like just because, yeah, that's that's kind of what I. That's if that happens, if that generally happens for everybody, from top to bottom, like our leaders to ch children to even the poorest people on the planet, we'll be a better we'll be a better place because we won't be so quick to do some of the things we were doing up until this point. Because why would we want more people to suffer? We all know what suffering I agree. feels like. I agree. I agree. I hope so. Josh, I hope so. Yeah. I, I hope, you know, I hope and I believe, you know, because here we are talking about this very down thing that everybody is dealing with, but that's the thing, that's that's the thing that I keep recognizing is it's not just me, it's not just you, it's everybody, mm -hmm. it's not just them, it's not just us, it's everybody, and I believe people are going to be more mindful because you can already see it. It ain't the same. Yeah. It ain't the same. People aren't walking around the same way. It has had an effect, let's say, mm -hmm. right? It has had an effect. And I, I think that effect is something that has given people something to think about. Yeah. In a good way. I mean, they say you go to the gym, no pain, no gain, right? How do you grow? If you're a bodybuilder, how do you grow? And I'm, I'm using simplistic uh, oh, examples, sure. but I think... The simple examples are the ones that work best because anybody can understand them, right? If you go to the gym, what's your goal? You're trying to build muscle and you're trying to lose fat. You're trying to get stronger and you're trying to get, you know, get rid of anything that is access that uh, you don't need. Well, the way you build muscle is by causing micro tears in your muscles when you lift and you strain that muscle and it basically mutates and grows back bigger because it says to your brain, yo, I gotta get a little bit stronger because the next time I go through this, I don't wanna suffer as much. And that's that's what's happening on a genetic level. And you're not gonna get that if you don't go. You're not gonna get that if you don't sweat. You're not gonna get that if you don't lift and go through the pain. You're gonna be sore the next day. And you're gonna be sore the next day, right? But if you wanna get those gains, if you wanna improve your physique, and if bodybuilding bores you, but we'll go with the more Greco-Romanesque statues, which are a little more artistic, if you want to get that physique and you want to build your body, which is a temple, you've got to go through a bit of pain. You're not going to get it for free, right? The universe is not going to reward you if you meet it 10%. you got to go halfway, and maybe the other half will come, right? Some, sometimes the universe tests you, too. I love, um, I, me I remember this, when I was more serious about... be a whole different podcast, the universe. <laughs> yes. No, I... The, no, 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 I... I just... Marcio and today on... Universe. On the universe in general, yes. I remember sometimes. Sometimes I find life will actually go. Are you sure you want this? There's always like that temptation to stop what you're doing. It's like, are you sure you want this? We'll throw something at you that is easier, or maybe you know what? You can get distracted, Dave. We'll throw this distraction at you, and we'll see what you do with it. Do you really want to go through the pain and gain? Um, and and. Uh, for me, it was actually recently. I, I had a chance. I, I could have gotten a. I could have got a job in this time working for what I did prior to it. Prior to walking away from my job, just on, on a more part-time basis, just for a regular income to come in. It's like that seems that seems like a nice deal. 
And I thought about it, it was like, nope, I'm just gonna go back exactly to where I was before. I don't wanna do that anymore. So I have to go through, so, and, and it, it's, and I find that like, like in terms of like gain, like the gain and pain concept here is we all gain, we all gain, we have to be willing to overcome the distractions. And the one good thing about right now is you can choose if you're going to be distracted or not. So. You can always choose, yes. right? even not, even if it's not right now. Yeah, absolutely. It's reminding us, but it's reminding us. Yes, very much. That you have the power, that it, you're not a victim, right? We are volunteers. There's a cliche, they always say, you mm -hmm. know. Uh, I like that one. You're, you're, and, it is, and this will connect to the, the graphic novel I'm doing, but I'm a firm believer that you are a designer of your life, mm -hmm. right? You're not, you're not a victim. You're not, you have control over 98% of what happens to you. Sure, you can't, uh, you can't control a storm. You can't control certain things, but the job that you took, hey man, you interviewed for it, right? The partner or spouse that you live with, you chose them, right? The stuff you put in your mouth that you eat, you're selecting. You're not a victim. And unfortunately, a lot of people like to act like it's someone else's fault because maybe they take a path down the road that doesn't work. They're disappointed. And so it's easier to blame someone else and not take personal responsibility than it is to admit something's wrong here and I need to change it and find a solution rather than gripe about it. But you, you're, you're an architect of your own life. Mm -hmm. And if you don't like your life, go change it. Because you can. You can make a different decision even right now. Right. Mm -hmm. So. And, and I wish more people believed that because it is true. It is true. You, you can actually factually prove it out, right? Like we're in a court of law. Excuse me. Did you? Well, you're married, right? Did, what was that? Was that forced on you? Did you like come from Saturn and land in this one place and he happened to be there? No. Right. You went on a date. You got to know each other. You shared conversations, right? You made a decision job that you don't like okay maybe you should work towards something else on the side maybe you've got that small business you'd like to start up maybe you have that hobby that is a dream that you would like to make a reality why don't you invest a bit in that if you don't like this job if you feel you don't like this company and your boss doesn't appreciate you and you feel like your efforts are, are overlooked put them where they won't be put them into yourself and build yourself up to be the job that you wish you had that you don't, right? Exactly. I think it's, I think, you know, I don't know. It sounds easy, right? Because it's easy to talk about. But I, I, I don't think it's easy. I think it's simple. I agree with that completely. But it's not easy. I'm not saying it's easy. No, simple and easy are not the same thing. But it's simple. Yeah. You can see that it can be done. This is not some magic potion, some mysterious, you know, alchemy this isn't some cosmic stuff it's simple man it's science if i do these things these things will happen mm -hmm. if i go in this direction i will be in that direction and i will be in a different place and i will see something different that's just the law of the universe whether you like it or not absolutely right? that's just the way it is this is cause and effect right it's actually just science okay so so i do these things you know if i come up to you and i push you you know, your reaction isn't going to be like, hey, man, it's going to see you. It's going to be like, why'd you do that? It's going to be a feeling of hurt. I'm your friend. Why would you shove me? I don't know what's going on. That was confusing me. Right? There are, there are certain things that happen when you do certain things. And if you're not doing those things and you're not getting the results that you want in your life at the same time, there might be a reason for that. Mm -hmm. Right? And it might be simpler than you think. Right? You, almost always is. Almost always is. Yeah. Um... Okay, we should. Right. We're, we're, let, let, let's shift gears because I. I mean, we've had a good hour conversation about. You want to, you want to go from gear five to gear one? Yeah, you, uh, different gear. I, actually, I, here, here's actually I. I was before we get into everything you've done because you've had an amazing career, right? I'm gonna ask this question. I don't know. Are you asking me or are you telling me? I I, 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 think I'm telling you. I looked you up. Okay. You've, you've done some really cool stuff. So before, before I don't even know what you know. So I'm, I'm that, 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 that's that 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 that. Well, so curious to know what you know about me because I don't know what you're. Well, so I looked up your IMDb, 
I looked up your some of your voice work. I've looked up like just some of the things you've done. And it's like, that's an impressive resume. You have a very, very impressive resume. You've done a lot of different things in your life and you've been going for towards different things your entire life, which is very impressive. Um, yeah. So, but I, I looked at what they all had in common and I decided to go, oh, and so I, that, yeah, so this is what I'm gonna ask you first. When did you fall in love with storytelling? Either this, hearing, what was the, either the story that really hooked you on stories or when did you realize that you were really good at it and you wanted to pursue it as a career? Or was it, did it happen at the same time? Wow. I can honestly say I've never been asked that. Yeah. That's cool. I got a brand new question today. Yeah. So I'm, I'm grateful for that, actually. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Is my honest answer. I mean, I'll tell you what it was like as a kid. Uh, I'll be honest. Yeah. As a kid... Um, I didn't make friends easily, is the truth. Mm -hmm. I grew up, and I would notice that other kids would have best friends. And I didn't have one for a very long period of time. By the time I finally had a very, very good friend, it was about fourth grade. And in the meantime, you know how kids are. You look around, you see what other what toys other kids have. You know, what houses other kids live in. Oh, they have a swing set. We don't. That type of thing. You know, you just make observations. And I was a kid that always stayed in my room. So to sum it up, I was a kid who always sat in my room. My dad would complain that I wouldn't go outside to play. And I would spend hours and hours and hours drawing. Okay. And reading comics and reading fairy tales and listening to way before audiobooks, way before books on tape records what were you so, listening to you don't mind my asking Alice in Wonderland oh wow uh, you know we're talking classic stories from Europe you know the Brothers Grimm okay were converted into fairy tales that were on LP so this is because my dad had this huge Sanyo stack of a, of a system it was ginormous man it was like seven layers mm -hmm. it was like one of those seven layer cakes okay. at a wedding right but it was all this, this uh, stereo system and he had records and he would buy these records and I would sit there and I would listen to stories but I, I think all kids do this as a child you're playing with action figures mm -hmm. and you're creating a story in your head mm -hmm. you're watching cartoons you're reading comic books or picture books you're using your imagination right because as a kid it hasn't been beaten out of you yet you got nothing to do. Mm -hmm. So what do you do? You make stuff up. Right? Absolutely. So I was that kind of kid. I wasn't uh, I wasn't an athletic kid. But later on, I became extremely athletic, which is very bizarre. I have this uh, lot of duality going on in my life early on to later. But my passion as a kid was drawing. I drew every single day. I drew with whatever was available. I drew wherever I was, if my parents went to, you know, Costco in 1984, when they first opened the first Costco store in Seattle, my dad would go and he'd go over to the pharmacy and I'd be sitting there and I'd grab a pen or a paper and I'd be drawing on something. You know, I was drawing more than I was listening to, to people around me, right? And so that was my passion as a kid was drawing. And then at some point, uh, by the time I hit around 20, I stopped. Because I'm in, I'm, I'm in my late 40s now, so it's been like 28-ish, 29-ish years. Uh, all right, so I'm, I'm going to ask... I don't draw. So just for the record, I don't draw at all. Oh, okay. Terrible. So when, when, when you did draw, what was your favorite thing yeah. to draw? Because every artist had like, like stuff. They like yeah. drawing certain things. So, yeah, it's going to be weird. I, I like to draw animals. Mm -hmm. So I'd flip through National Geographic, and I would draw camels and mallard ducks you know, foxes, and, <laughs> and true story, naked women. R really? Yeah. What? Naked, and, and this is kind of funny, when I was about 14, I ended up getting a, a swimsuit issue, let's just say, right? Nothing, nothing. No, no, nothing you know, too risky. Let me, let me clarify, nothing graphic, nothing hardcore, nothing crazy. No. 
I got a magazine and there were beautiful women in it and they were wearing bikinis. It was very European, you know, some some images might have been topless, but whatever. You know, there's there's paintings and statues that are religious that have nudity, so get yeah. over it, you know. And uh, my, my background is, you know, my father's Italian and not from Argentina, so I'm entitled, whatever. <laughs> But I would draw, I was uh, fascinated with uh, the female form. And so I was constantly drawing animals and drawing naked women. But not in a perverted way. This wasn't uh, This wasn't something grotesque or vulgar. It was just uh, somebody would be sunbathing in the moonlight or somebody would be walking in a breeze, okay. this kind of thing, you know, very, very innocent, very, very natural, you know. So, what athletics did you get into? Like, what did you start with? Like, when did you realize, oh my god, I can do do stuff? What, what, was it basketball, football? Was no, it? No. Well, my dad, my dad made me. Uh, my dad was a whole Sicilian man. Okay. So he was he's a big time uh, disciplinarian, you know. So you know, he was like, I think kung fu or karate would be good for the boy, you know. So he forced me into all these martial arts classes, which I just dreaded. I started off with like Arnis, which is a Filipino martial art, okay. and, you know, Hop Kido and Karate. And I was like terrible at them because again, we talked about earlier when you don't want to do something. Yeah. You, you don't just, learn. No. So by the time I got to the next class, my teacher might have been a little bit frustrated because he's like, you know, right punch, left punch. Yeah, okay, I know that. Uh, you know, crescent kick, you know, this, uh, 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 were you paying attention? Well, no, I wasn't, you know. Yeah. So I, I dreaded martial arts. My dad said we did take a lot of martial arts, and it was a disaster. You know? <laughs> he wasted a lot of money. You know? Okay. Yeah. And, but what happened is, in my neighborhood, uh, so I grew up in Seattle, and what happened in my neighborhood was that um, my my friends growing up in my teenagers in high school were primarily uh, Chicano, Mexican-American. In the neighborhood that I grew up in, um, the neighborhood, the community was mostly Samoan, oh, Vietnamese, wow. yeah, uh, Chicano, which okay. is, you know, American-born, Mexican, ethnic roots, uh, Filipino. My two best friends in the very beginning were Filipino. So the, the guys, some of the guys used to play on a high school team, and we would go to the local park and uh, Thanksgiving, uh, Christmas Eve, you know, we would play these football games. Mm -hmm. And we started playing football, and I hated football because I, I don't like sports. I wasn't in a baseball, basketball, football, hockey, nothing. Now, my introduction to football actually came through the original Nintendo video game system. Oh, God. I remember that via game. 19, via 1991, all right? Yeah, okay, I remember that game. Two came out. It's terrible. <laughs> this happened is Tech Mobile had already existed, but Super Tech Mobile came out, and Super Tech Mobile was a huge leap from Tech Mobile. It had all the teams, it had a bigger playbook, because I mean, the original Tech Mobile was a disaster, it had like, what, four run plays and four pass plays. Yeah, it's really, you know, it's, it's a terrible game, I remember it so well, it's awesome, like everybody, every Nintendo it's person. terrible now. Yeah, yeah, no. E oh, okay, let's let's be honest. It was terrible then too. It just it just it was all we had. So. No, all we had. <laughs> yeah. So super super tech mobile. So what happened is I would go over to my friend's house. I these two Filipino brothers, Paul and Orlando Javier. I go over to their house, live in my neighborhood. We would always play all these different games: Contra, you know, Metroid. You go through all these games, and they were awesome because they were sci-fi, they were fantasy, they were fighting games. And then one day I come over and the new game that we had trended to was super technical. So you can imagine my disappointment. I'm a kid who doesn't play sports. I don't know any of these teams. Even though I live in Seattle, we have the Seattle Seahawks. And I, I was so disappointed. And I'm like, well, this is going to be four weeks of having to slosh through this damn game for me, right? They were digging it. But what ended up happening was through super technical, true story, I learned to play football. I learned the teams. I learned the players. Oh, Lawrence Taylor's an outside linebacker for the New York Giants. Mm -hmm. Oh, John Offord is another linebacker for the Miami Dolphins, right? And so forth and so forth. You know, I learned the positions. I learned the game play. I learned the offensive um, strategies, defensive strategies. 
And then, because my interest was peaked and it started ramping up in my neighborhood, the guys were playing football. So we go play. And quite quickly, I realized, oh shit, I am quite, I am athletic. I'm fast. I'm fast, and I like to hit people, and I like to get hit. Wait a minute. You know, for a nerd kid who loves to draw and loves to do stories and, and sit in his room by himself, this was, uh, I don't know, it was an epiphany. Mm. And anyways, we, I, we started playing and I started getting better and better and better. And within two years of playing in my neighborhood in, in Washington State at that time, I don't know anymore, there's a semi-pro football league. Mm-hmm. Made up of you know uh, college players that didn't get drafted or make it t- uh, to teams as an undrafted free agent. Mm-hmm. Uh, former college players that might have had a severe knee injury that just couldn't continue a pro career, but could play semi-pro. He might have been less grueling. Mm-hmm. Guys that had talent that just went to the the semi-pro league, and out of nowhere. I ended up making a team called the Snohomish King County Blue Knights. I believe they're defunct now. And I made it as literally, if I recall correctly, the 63rd player of a 63-man roster. Barely talking third-string wide receiver. I was fast as hell. I can get open, but I just couldn't catch, right? <laughs> the, quarterback threw the, ball, the, the quarterback threw the ball too damn hard. I just couldn't get my hands on it because of the velocity. And I, I just didn't have that that upbringing, that conditioning yet, you know, two years in. And my hands were small compared to, compared to football players, right? I wasn't a big dude. I mean, I consider my hands to be a normal size, but not for catching a football, right? Mm-hmm. I'm not a six foot five, 250 pound tight end, right? But um, the, the special teams coach, or special teams captain, sorry, had been my manager at McDonald's when I was 15 and a half, when I got my first job. Nice. And I believe, I suspect, I've never confirmed it, that he took pity on me on the tryouts, and they added me as the last player as a, what the hell? I know this kid, he's a good kid. Let's give him a shot. You know, he's, he's gonna be buried on the depth chart. He's not gonna play very much. And it was true, in that first year, I caught one pass for seven yards, and that was it in the entire season. Oh, we had a horrible season. I think we won like two games. A- ass back position. Get your ass back to the bench. <laughs> yeah. Now, what's interesting is the following year, the league expanded, mm-hmm. and there was a team called the uh, the South King County Lions. It was a new team. I left this team that I had been basically, you know, lowest man on the totem pole. Went to a new team in every single game we were a terrible team we only won two games but I scored like 13 touchdowns in 10 games that's good and literally out of nowhere went from being this kid who's attempting a sport that I know very little about didn't grow up with pop corner football didn't grow up with anything except for technical and jumped from one team to another and became prolific You don't know what you don't know, mm-hmm. right? Sometimes you have, we have, we have blind spots, mm-hmm. and those blind spots sometimes hide positive or negative things. So but they definitely hide. They hide things that we don't know. And so suddenly I realized, like, hey, oh, I, I'm pretty fast. I'm pretty. I'm pretty. I have fast twitch muscle fibers. I'm pretty athletic. Um, I didn't know this, you know. And, and but that was the extent of it that was the extent of it I played two years of semi-pro I, I hit 21 and then at that point going forward I uh, went into an arena which I'm uh, we're probably going to end up talking about here that is extremely athletic and extremely physical and vastly different than American football yes so because here's the thing that you strike me as and it, I, I look for things you, that you have in common with everything you do. So what do athletics and arts have in common? The answer is discipline. They both require a heavy discipline to be really good at both. Talent is not enough in either of them. You have to put the work in. 
the difference now obviously the execution of those disciplines are very different yeah but sure but the but the but the basic mental fortitude is the same you show up you do the work you do the reps you go out there you perform and you repeat and then you struck me as a man that actually you strike me as a man that enjoys discipline which when I looked at your resume I was like okay that explains why we went into dance which is the which is the, the where I, it explains it to me very much because two things I think dancing is very underrated I think it's one of the most physical things you can do it's it takes an incredible amount of strength coordination practice and it is can be in and going back to the storytelling aspect of it dance dance fighting pro wrestling choreography they're not that different right they're not that there 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 are there are rules that apply to all of them that they all fundamentals that are all across the board yeah yeah yeah, exactly and 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 so again for a kid that like to draw and for a kid that's athletic dance is a nice middle like it's a nice start of choosing of like where those disciplines meet and that's kind of that was my theory it's maybe why you liked why you enjoyed it am i wrong No, 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 no. How, how, why you went into dancing? Because what happened? Because I, I think. Because <laughs> it, it, it. Surprised? No, I actually. You'll be surprised about two things. You'll be surprised to find out the kind of dancing I did. Yeah. You'll be surprised to find out why I went into it. Okay, sure. Tell me. So yeah. So. Um, okay, so this is something that I have rarely talked about because. Uh, when I moved from Seattle, my hometown that I grew up in, uh, in my early 30s, I moved to Los Angeles. I've been living out here for 12 years, but I spent a good three decades plus in Seattle. Um, before I moved over here, um, when I moved to LA, it, it was told to me that it's best I just focus on what I'm doing once I get to Los Angeles and not bring up what I had done. What I had, the dance that I did, I was a stripper. Mm-hmm. Okay. I was, a, I was a male stripper. Okay. You, you, you're not my first male stripper I've interviewed, by the way, so don't worry about it. Yeah. But I might be your most, I might be your most interesting. <laughs> I've known tons of guys that did it for a few years, but I did it for 15 years. I've done over 4,000 parties, over 750 review shows. I've owned two groups. And I used to own an agency called Stripgram, the original. Oh, wow. Which was the company founded by the man, William Keaton, in 1979, the same year that Chippendales was established. The world-famous Chippendales. By the guy that invented the stripping telegram. So William Keaton, in 1979, had this brilliant idea of sending people to go to their bachelorette parties, birthday parties, uh, ladies night out, going away parties, pranks, whatever, to send entertainers to their locations to surprise them. And that birthed the the singing telegram, the stripping telegram, which later just became stripping. No telegram, no messages, just, you know, flesh and fun. And that happened in Washington State. He had established that company in Washington. And he had owned it for 16 years until another lady came along, Julie Kennedy, and purchased it from him, who had worked in his office as a manager. And she ran it for another seven years until I was hired by her early in my 20s. And within a few years, I bought it from her and her sister and ran it for a few years until I sold it to a competitor once I had built it back up. So, you know, for example, um, probably the most famous thing recently is Channing Tatum, Mm -hmm. Magic Mike. Yeah. He kind of knows what that is. But here's the thing, Channing Tatum, not not to throw shade on Channing Tatum, he seems like a really nice guy, you know, cool cool guy. Uh, But Channing Tatum, my understanding is he danced for about two years in Mm -hmm. Miami. And he was brilliant in turning one of his life experiences into a movie that he made a lot of money off of. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. For 
for taking something in his life that was a sliver and turning it into billions. But Channing Tatum, you know, is someone who did it for a short period of time and not to any major national level. It's local. You know, you were dancing at a club, dude. You were, maybe did some parties. You delved in it for a bit, but you never reached, reached the pinnacle. You know, you never did it for, I did it for 15 years. I bought a house doing it, right? Yeah. So it's something that I did as a career for 15 years. Every weekend, day in and day out, you know, and um, there weren't a lot of guys that did that, even no. to this day in Washington State. And we're talking about, I came in in the 90s, and I was second generation. So, you know, male stripping is very different than female stripping. The only thing they have in common is a title. So you're talking about, you know, when you go to a female strip club, you go in, the girls are scantily clad. They're on a stage. They're being seductive. They come over, they give lap dances, and you pay them for their time, whether that's chatting or, you know, getting dry humped. <laughs> yes. You know, and that's it. Guys, the way that men look at it psychologically is, I'm coming in here to look at a beautiful girl, TNA. Mm -hmm. That's it. In male stripping, it's different. Women are indulging fantasies. Mm -hmm. And they are coming to see a show. And you're wearing a costume. It's thematic. You're performing. There's a narrator or MC during the show. It's a Vegas-style show. Mm -hmm. Right? It is the opposite. It is the same in title, but the opposite in psychology. And literally, I mean, this, this, this shows you how men and women are different, because if, if a guy goes to a club and he sees a gorgeous gal, and she's not very charming, maybe a little off-putting, um, and she's a bit rude, the guy goes, dude, I don't care. She's hot. Whereas women, if you're a t six foot four, chiseled guy, perfect abs, you have an amazing performance, and you're rude, a girl will say, you know what? He's a jerk. Just Joshing is sponsored by Walla Wishes by Susie Vidori. Walla Wishes is the conclusion of the Aurora nominated trilogy by Susie. Ada and Courtney are forced to join forces as the school and the fountain are in danger of going away forever. And if the fountain is destroyed, what will that do to Ada and Courtney? Walla Wishes is available now at Alice Nest Books. Click on the link in the description below to place your order. I know what you're thinking. What a cruel spot to leave it at the cliffhanger. Go ahead and show more, and, and you will. I, I promise. Uh, this is part one. Part two is going to be Thursday. Part three is going to be, you know, the conclusion. There's going to, And the rest of this are going to be at least 15-minute episodes. So, um, Mars is an amazing dude. And he's done a lot of different things. And it keeps getting more interesting from here. So, uh, before I continue, I want to thank Marcio for taking all this time with me and giving me a great interview, and I'm, and this was definitely a very good, I think, part one, and part two is this Thursday. I fell asleep today. Windsor, I, I gotta get used to the humidity in Windsor, Ontario again. Uh, I'm not used to it. it it's, uh, it's different than what it was in Alberta and BC. Um, I kind of miss the, uh, rain and coolness of it. Um... But, uh, yeah, man, it's going to be, it's going to be good. Um, but for now, thanks for listening to this episode of Just Joshing. If you want to support the podcast, you can do so in a number of different ways. Subscribe to the podcast, iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, Stitcher, and more. I am everywhere. Just click the subscribe button and leave a review. Also, I have merchandise, jpentelresco.redbubble.com. Uh, description link below. If you got a few bucks, you can, you know, want to buy a cup or shirt, you can do that. Um, if you want uh, to buy my book, The Cloud Diver, it's currently available on Amazon.com. Link is also in the description below. Beyond that, my YouTube channel is Joshua Pentelaresco. My Twitter and Facebook is J Pentelaresco. I'm sorry, Twitter and Instagram is J Pentelaresco. My Facebook is Josh Pentelaresco the Podcast. My webpage is J Pentelaresco at WordPress.com. It's slowly being relaunched. Stay inspired out there, guys. I will be talking to you guys soon. And see you on Thursday with part two. Josh. Shush.